You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. And we're back. Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Tuesday morning, joined by Morang Van Putten and Louis Dizon. We are talking Quranic studies. And gentlemen, both of y'all, welcome to the show. How are y'all? Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm good. Wonderful day today, and uh, I'm happy to be talking. And, and I think I butchered the name. Um, no, can, no, can it was you... pretty good. <laughs> um, it was pretty good. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your expertise in this area before we dive in. Yeah, sure. So so I'm, I'm Marijn van Putten. That's how I pronounce it in Dutch, but most people say Marijn van Putten, and that's good too. Um, and um, I... I'm a linguist uh, at its base. Um, that's what my, my background is in. That's what I do. I work on historical linguistics mostly. Um, but in recent years, my, my, my research has really focused on um, the history of the Quran and the history of Arabic specifically, and then um, and the Quran more, more, even more specifically, and on the textual history of the, of the Quran and these kinds of things. So that's really what I've been focusing on. And also the reading traditions of the Quran and how those develop. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to this. Now, Lewis, been a little while since we've had you on, right? Yeah, uh, it's been a little while. That's right. And uh, I think it's also been a while since we last had an episode dedicated to Islamic studies. That's so, right. Yeah. So it's nice to get on that boat again. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, I think that uh, Marine is a great person to discuss this matter with because he's been making a lot of waves as of late um, in this uh, field, especially with his recently published book on Quranic Arabic, which we'll be getting to in a moment. Mm. Um, yeah, so I do have some prepared questions to um, get us on the right track for that. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm interested because you're, so you went so you went into linguistics and it's specifically historical linguistics am i right yeah that's right yeah great so i think um yeah because there's a i have a, actually a lot of friends who are in linguistics so i find that it's always very fascinating to speak with them and get their insights on languages and i know you have a special interest in semitic languages so can you tell us a little bit about that journey how you became interested in semitics and arabic more specifically yeah yeah sure so so my my original ba was it was in comparative indo-european linguistics so that's working on the indo-european languages those are the languages that you know the language we're speaking right now um the sense so um you know the languages of europe and mostly northern india and and iran and these will go back to a single ancestor. And I always found this incredibly fascinating, like this, this reconstructing of like this prehistoric ancestor that we don't really know when it was spoken, but we can actually say something about what the language was like, what kinds of words they had. And from that deduce, you know, what, what kind of society these people had. Uh, and just, it's really fun puzzling with these languages and see how they developed over time. And um, I had already developed some interest. I mean, this happens when you're doing linguistics and especially historical linguistics. You don't stop, you know, at, at the 30 languages you learned in your BA, but you do some Semitic on the side. So I did some Arabic and it's in Hebrew. And, um, and I kind of rolled into that. And actually, before I rolled into that, I, I kind of had a, had a sidetrack, an important sidetrack that I wouldn't want to forget, is that during my MA linguistics, um, I worked a lot with the Berber languages. And the Berber languages are the, the indigenous languages of North Africa. Um, and are still spoken there today by millions of speakers, and they're fascinating, beautiful, really uh, in interesting languages. Ultimately, in a, in a deep, far past related to, to the Semitic languages, because it's part of the Afroasiatic uh, language phylum, um, but they're really, I mean, really super cool. Um, so I did my PhD in that, actually. So my PhD is in, is in um, is it, I wrote a, a grammar of a Libyan Berber dialect from Ojila, and while I was doing that, kind of working with Berber mostly, um, Berber has tons of long words from Arabic, and some of them look kind of strange. Some of them don't quite look like the Arabic that is spoken in the region at you know the current time. So I kind of rolled into this doing kind of historical linguistic -y things, um, and at around this time, um, Ahmed Al Jalad came to Leiden, and he was doing fantastic work on pre-Islamic Arabic. 
So I just got very fascinated. Like, what can we learn about like ancient dialectology? What can we do about that? And what can we learn about Arabic? And it really, he highlighted for me, and I think uh, a kind of unease I always had working with Semitic languages, specifically with Arabic, is like Arabic orthography doesn't look like anything that would make sense if you were trying to write classical Arabic. So what's going on with that? Where's classical Arabic coming from? And I kind of got sucked into that question and got sucked into the question first with um, some historical dialectology without working together with that. And um, so I got interested in Semitic languages that kind of, you know, is, is part of it. And that's what I worked on. But it really came from the Arabic side. So basically through Berber to Arabic and then back to Semitic again. Um, and uh, and I really felt like I could do something uh, with Arabic, with historical Arabic, where I was like, this is, it's, it's really strange. You know, it's, it's, it's probably the biggest Semitic language ever uh, with the most literature out there and um, with a really long history. And nobody, nobody's really doing historical linguistics in it. They're all like, well, it's been solved, which it really, really hadn't. Um, so that's kind of how I rolled into it and started working uh, with, you know, the question of the history of Arabic. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting, especially how you say that despite the amount of study that's been done on Arabic, not much has been done on the historical linguistic side. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned uh, Ahmed al Jalad. So you would say that he's one of your main formative influences when you were first becoming interested in chronic Arabic, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah. So, so you know, Arabic more generally, absolutely. Uh, Ahmed is, is is a great friend of mine, and and you know, just does really mm -hmm. really interesting research. Um, and besides that, you know. Um, there's of course you know there, there's so many so many great people who worked on these kinds of things so you know uh, Joshua Blau who's very important hasn't done much in the Quran has done really important stuff on say medieval Arabic and especially Judeo Arabic and Christian Arabic and kind of bring a very philological linguistic lens to looking at, at early stages of the language and I very much feel like I'm in the extension of that um, but just applying it to the Quran um, and uh, that that's been a lot of fun so. Uh, I consider him quite an important influence as well. Um, yeah. Uh, that's cool. That's cool. And then, so you recently published that book, Quranic Arabic with Brill. Um, you know, it's always yeah, fun to right here. a new... <laughs> Brill books are always yeah. fun to read, but they're also really hard to come by because they always mm -hmm. have like over $100 a piece. Um, fortunately, you know, I believe this one, they're making, Brill is actually making it available uh, for free online. So yeah. people who are interested can um, actually uh, peruse it um, without yeah. coughing up that hefty price. Yeah, yeah. But, no, um, it's, it's abs absolutely open access. So if yeah. you, you can download it, you can look it up. If you just look for our name and, and Quranic Arabic and you'll find it. So uh, no, that's really, really fantastic. And honestly, like the physical price for a Brill book, it's not that bad, uh, but it's still expensive. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. So, uh, you know, I'm interested in a lot of the um, research that you've done in this area. Um, out of curiosity, what would you say are some common misconceptions, both among Muslims and non-Muslims, when it comes to, you know, Quranic Arabic? Uh, well, I mean, the most, most obvious misconception is, of course, that if you just get a modern modern Quran today and open it up. That is the Quran and that's the only Quran there is. Uh, that's certainly not the case. Whatever you, you take away from, from, from my, my book, basically, um, it's certainly true that that is only reflecting one form of Quran that's around. Uh, there are, you know, it's, it's, it's usually, um, if you do it over here, you might actually get two different options, but in most of the world, if you if you buy a buy a Quran a, a Quran copy, uh, you get the reading tradition of Hassan Asim, um, which is only one uh, transmission of only one reading. There are ten canonical readings with two canonical transmissions each, and um, so that's only one, and that that's really an obvious misconception. And these things, these reading traditions are interesting in all kinds of different ways but one way they really differ is that they're linguistically quite distinct from one another even though they're basically using the same uh, consonantal skeleton uh, the way they actually interpret those words and how they pronounce certain words and these linguistic features which as a linguist i get very excited about and other people might say you know why are you getting so excited about a hamza uh, you know that's what we linguists do um, these things actually differ between these reading traditions and it's not obvious 
which one, you know, a priori, it's not obvious which one is the correct one, if any of them. Um, so that's a very, very kind of central, uh, and it's it's there, you know, not just among you know Muslims and, and non-Muslims, but it's there even, I would say, uh, among Quranic scholars. Very few people are aware of the kind of linguistic variation that is present in the Quran and in its reading traditions. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the Hamza in particular because mm -hmm. um, for those who are not familiar, it's like a little small, you could say, letter that mm -hmm. is sometimes um, at the end of certain arabic words but it's a very small one and a lot of times you can omit it and it wouldn't really affect the um um the word in question but i find interesting that that's one of the um differences you highlighted because mm. i think from the perspective of someone who reads arabic the omission of a hamza seems like a really like minute mm. detail Right, and then so, so so and that's kind of also the point, right? Um, so this is kind of a strange thing about how how classical Arabic is written, is that even though Hamza is, is a full consonant of of the Arabic language, it's not written as one. It's always written as a kind of diacritic on top of other letters. And well, when you see this kind of thing as a linguist, you're like, why would you not just use the alif for it, which, which is a normal letter to use it for, which is you know what Hebrew used to use and what what Arabic used to use, and in fact what pre-Islamic Arabic used to use to write this sound. Mm -hmm. And at some point that gets lost. And, you know, part, part of one of the conclusions that I draw in my book is like, if you look at the rhyme, if you look at at how kind of the, the orthography of the Quran works, it seems like the dialect that it was composed in did not have this Hamza at all. And it was only added later to the text. And you see mm -hmm. that there's differences between the reading traditions, like which word is supposed to have a Hamza, which one isn't supposed to have a Hamza, when are you pronounced, supposed to pronounce it, when are you supposed to drop it. Um, they all have it to some extent, but really if you, if you look at the text, if you look at the rhyme, it seems like that is not really part of the original language of the Quran in that sense. Ah, it's very interesting. So besides that, um... Are there any like findings that surprised you while you were doing research for this book? Mm. Things that like you didn't expect to find. Yeah, um, I have to think about this for a little bit. Um, I mean, tons of tiny things, of course. Uh, yeah. But one that I what I found myself quite perplexed by is the fact that. Um, if you if you look at Quranic Arabic um, and if you take the standard reading tradition, uh, there are three long vowels a, uh, e, and u, and that's never sat right with me because the a, uh, especially at the end of a word, can be written in two different ways. Either you write it with an alif or you write it with a ya. Why would you write the same sound in two ways? That's odd. Um, and it's really quite clear that those were two different vowels. Uh, so. Quranic Arabic did not have three long vowels, but had four or maybe even five. So a, e, u, and a, and this a is is, is say the fourth fourth vowel, and it's absolutely obvious that that's a contrastive sound in Quranic Arabic because it cannot rhyme with a, um, so it's clearly a different sound. And there's a very obvious rhyme. And what I found most surprising is not so much finding that um, I, I kind of had a sense that that was going on. And actually, some people have commented on it on in the past. Uh, for example, Nodeke. Uh, the famous uh, fantastic Nobeke, um noticed this, but for some reason, this kind of got forgotten um, in in the past hundred years, and people were not really commenting on it anymore. And even you know, as late as t 2020, people will say, "No, these these sounds are just the same and just written differently." It's like that's absolutely not the case. There might be like parts, you know, classical Arabic that's probably the case, at least in say the, the classical period. But in the Quran, it's it's very obvious not a case, and it's 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 one of those things that it surprised me that there was such a blind spot for these kinds of very obvious um, philological methods, like looking at rhyme, looking at orthography, trying to correlate those with each other, looking at etymology, which is important as well, which just doesn't get done, and even when it does get done, everybody else just ignores it, and th that's one of the things that really surprised me, time and time again. Why is the Quran not a text? on which we can use the philological methods that we have developed for Hebrew, for Aramaic, for anything else. Um, you know, Arabic is just another language and these methods should work. Um, so why aren't they used? That that's, was really most surprising to me. Yeah, actually, 
Yeah, that's a good question. And I know because when I first started learning Arabic, it was in modern standard Arabic. And I remember that when they were teaching us vowels, it was the same three vowels that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Like there was no mention that, you know, there were um, others besides that. So when I heard from you that there were historically other vowels um, in Quranic Arabic, that was Mm -hmm. actually quite the epiphany to me. Right. Right. And it's not just that, you know, it's it's like those are also there in the reading traditions, like, uh, you know, three mm-hmm. three of the 10 canonical reading traditions, well, actually five of the 10 canonical reading traditions have this va- kind of vowel contrast. Like they're not making this up. Um, the grammarians talk about it in great detail. But for some reason, you know, people don't read the grammarians, the, you know, the classical grammarians um, and, and just kind of skipped over this and just all kind of agreed that you know this modern standard arabic standard that is around now was somehow the standard in the seventh century which is a very strange assumption to make uh, especially if the grammarians are telling you something differently that is that is probably the biggest surprise now now that i think about it it's not so much you know that um that these vowels and people are kind of missing it but it's like the grammarians actually tell us like even if we're going to say well we're going to look at you know what class square because according to grammarians you know, who worked on this in, in, in the 8th and ninth centuries. Um, well, even if you look at those, the data is right there. You know, even if you say we don't need to do all this philological stuff, they've done that, you know, you know, over a millennium ago. Well, I mean, let's then actually look at what these, these scholars do over a millennium ago. And nobody does. Like, people are not reading these grammarians. It's very strange to me. Yeah. Yeah. I know that uh, one common mistake, which even I admittedly fall into sometimes is to take like our understanding of modern standard Arabic and then try to back project it onto earlier periods, Uh, which actually leads me to the other question that uh, I have in your book. You mentioned the fact that Quranic Arabic um, is just one of many varieties of Arabic Mm -hmm. that could broadly be classified as Al Arabiya which in turn is distinct from what a lot of grammarians would refer to as classical Arabic as right. codified by those later grammarians. Could you unpack some of those differences that you yeah. mentioned? Yeah, so, so this is, I mean, so there, there's this strange um, assumption, I, I think, with modern scholars that we know what classical Arabic is, and it's a very strict set of rules and it's the kind of rules that we find in our modern textbooks and i've sometimes chosen to call this textbook classical arabic because our textbooks tell us this what's really strange about this is even though clearly those norms have been around for quite some time i think you know when you get to the year thousand maybe 1100 um those are clearly no norms of classical arabic but if you look at the grammarians even as late as that they don't actually describe those norms. Those norms are not what the grammarians were interested in. So grammarians are, the, the, the Arab grammarians were incredibly interested in uh, writing down the variation, saying like, you know, you can do this, you can do that, you can leave this out. So yes, you can have, you know, four or five vowels and you're still Arabia. That's no problem. You can leave out the Hamza. That's perfectly part of Arabia. And you can, you know, you say, you, you can say Velika, you can say Velika, both of those Arabia. So, they are very um, accepting of a lot of variation. Um, also not accepting of other kinds of variation. They just don't mention that. But they are very happy to say, you know, this is proper, that's proper, and all of that is proper, and all we can do that. Um, but then if we look at how we actually write classical Arabic today, say modern standard Arabic, but even like earlier, those norms um, have really been codified at some point, but they don't get codified in these books, not even by later grammarians. They are just, just this kind of understood, accepted norm. This is how you're supposed to do classical Arabic. And how far that really goes is something that we're only just starting to find out. Um, you can find actual differences between, you know, how 20th century uh, Malian classical Arabic writers write classical Arabic compared to how they do it in Turkey in the 20th century. Um, and that really goes back to ancient patterns uh, that were described by the grammarians. Um, and it's very much influenced by the Quran and how they recite the Quran differently, but it's there and you can find these kinds of patterns. Um, so that's really kind of what Arabia comes down to. And of course, we often equate classical Arabic with Arabia, and which is fine. I mean, classical Arabic is a perfectly good translation of Arabia. But if we're going to do that, if we're going to call it classical Arabic, we have to accept the variation that the grammarians give us. 
And if we're not going to, if we're just going to say, no, we mean this very specific subset of these specific features that we still use in modern standard Arabic today, and none of the features that um, are part of the Arabia according to grammarians, we should probably give it a different name, like modern standard Arabic, which is an okay name for that. Um, but the danger is indeed back projecting all of those norms that we have today, this very strict set of norms and back project it into the past. And you know, very often, you once you actually start looking, you see that there's a difference there. Um, because, um, for example, you know, um, in, in, in modern standard Arabic today, it's not very typical to say hunalika for there. You say hunaka. Um, but the Quran doesn't have hunaka even a single time. It always uses hunalika, right? That's a very small difference, but it's a noticeable difference. The same is for here, you know, in, in modern standard Arabic, you would typically say huna. The Quran never uses huna. He uses ha huna, always uses ha huna. So if we're going to say, well, these very strict norms of, of, of you know, modern standard Arabic, those are Arabic, well, then even the Quran is in Arabic, um, which is obviously an absurd conclusion. But, you know, I had to really kind of get that down in my books. Like, we need to be aware of what assumptions we're making about what the grammarians mean when they say Arabic, basically. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting uh, how the Quran doesn't use some of those words that we learn in modern standard Arabic because, you know, when you speaking from experience, you know, learning mm. uh, MSA and then looking at the Ar Arabic of the Quran and finding how it's different, I'm like, what's going on here? Like, mm -hmm. it's not what I learned. Um, now, speaking of the Quran, you know, because um, historically, uh, exegetes of the Quran did, in fact, rely on the grammarians um, to learn how to properly interpret it to, to a certain extent. Um, in our, you know, your in findings when you're doing this study on Quranic Arabic, do they impact the exegesis of the Quran in any significant way? Um, I mean, I guess in some ways. Um, so, so I, th I think my 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 book. Um, is 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 very strongly uninterested in those kinds of questions, um, which is doesn't mean I'm not interested in those kinds of things. But it's I I, I felt like I wanted to divide that as much as possible. Um, but of course, what you do see is that the text that we have and the earliest form of the text that we have is this kind of quite ambiguous consonantal skeleton, uh, which is really what what the basis of my book is about: studying that consonantal skeleton. What can we learn about the language from that? The thing is, that's ambiguous. Um, every now and then, multiple things could be read in those places. And the grammarians were very much interested in that, even from a theoretical perspective. It's like, OK, well, if you have this, you could read it like this, and it would mean that. Or you could read it in this other way, and it have this different meaning. So clearly, from these kind of ambiguities that are there, a kind of um, exegesis comes forth, right? Uh, and we see that within the same ambiguous text, multiple interpretations do come out. Uh, there are also hundreds of interpretations that if you manage to render those into translation at all, um, that's already very impressive, but it hardly matters, right? It's questions of like, do you treat angels as a masculine plural or do you uh, treat it as a feminine singular? Which doesn't say anything about the gender of angels, it's just how you conceptualize plurality. Um, I mean, I guess you could kind of make a case like maybe in one case it was more angels than in the other. Uh, and can those be true at the same time? But that's, you know, kind of trying to find as, as controversial stuff as possible from very, very little. Um, those things are not very important, but they're grammatically, of course, very interesting. If you kind of want to know, OK, what's going on with this? Apparently, you could read it in both ways. Um, so apparently, you know, the agreement of the verb had some kind of leeway. And that's indeed what we see. Uh, and it's just sometimes you run into these places and it's actually ambiguous and it could be both ways. And you see that readers come to both ways conclusions. Uh, and sometimes they actually don't come to both ways conclusions. And that's very interesting as well. It's like you could have technically read this in two different ways and you wouldn't even have impacted the meaning all that much, but still all the canonical readers are in agreement to read it in one way and not in the other. Um, so how much effect does that have on exegesis? Um, both a lot and, and not that much, like everything, right? Ultimately, exegesis is dependent on language. And what we know about the language has an impact on what, what, the, what the text even means. Um, but to what extent, you know, uh, my, my research like radically 
uh, reinterprets what the Quran means, I, I don't think it does at all. I think uh, basically what the exegetes have written was much smarter and much much more impressive than what I've done. Um, so they have a pretty good sense of you know what's going on with that. Right, and uh, I also remember um, in some of your past tweets you talked about how if we were to really stretch it, we could come up with some really wild um, alternate readings for some passages. Right. One of the favorite ones that uh, I remember you brought up is how in Surat al-Baqarah uh, talks about the Sabians, the Sabi'un, mm -hmm. but you could, you could right. um, theoretically say that that's actually talking about soap, Sabun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is actually uh, one of the canonical readings, by the way. It just doesn't mean so, yeah. but right. But you could, of course, uh, right. You you can basically, you know, play around with these things endlessly, and and uh, what's it is it is worth appreciating. I mean, it's actually an important point. It's worth appreciating that even though the text is pretty ambiguous, and it's like we shouldn't overdo it. Like it's mo most of the time, you know, you know, another other famous uh, option is, you know, with also sort of the Baqarah, if you do, uh, you know, ذلك الكتاب لا ريبة فيه, you can technically read that as 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 ذلك uh, الكباب لا زيت فيه, right? Uh, this kebab, there is no there is no oil on it. But I mean, that's obviously a nonsensical reading. Um, like, sure, that that's technically what you could be reading there. You could be redotting everything and see where it goes. Uh, but that's obviously in context. You know, the Quran is not interested in whether there's oil or your kebab or not. Um, it's clearly about, you know, this book, there's no doubt in it. Um, um, or that book, technically. Um, so uh, the text is, is, is in many ways ambiguous. You could technically reread everything um, and get a completely absurd Quran out of it. Um, and it's pretty obvious that that's not the case. Uh, and on the other hand, you see that what's really striking is just how little variation we really find. There's there's really a broad consensus on how the text should be understood. And sure, there are a couple of thousand places where, where readers are in disagreement with, with one another how to read a certain passage or not. But very often, this has very little effect on the meaning. Uh, sometimes it has something, you know, slightly bigger, but very little effect on the meaning. But the vast majority of the text is basically agreement on the text, uh, even though that would have ne wouldn't have necessarily been obvious if people had just got in this book, had no idea how to read it, and just started, you know, doing this independently and figuring something out. That's probably not what's going on. There was probably a understanding of what the text was supposed to say, and then the book came, and that kind of continued that understanding of the text. Right, right. Shifting gears a little bit, uh, I also want to uh, talk a little bit about the concept of loanwords, mm -hmm. um, because this is one of those things that also comes up when we're discussing Quranic Arabic. I know that ever since Arthur Jeffrey published that book, The Foreign Vocabulary mm -hmm. of the Quran, there's been a strong interest in trying to see if this or that word mm -hmm. in the Quran actually derives from um, you know, a certain other language, usually another Semitic language like Syriac or Ethiopic. I remember one of the interesting things uh, because you were interviewed by Dr. Gabriel Side Reynolds recently. Mm -hmm. I remember Dr. Reynolds once saying, for example, that the word Quran comes from a Syriac word, Karyana. Mm -hmm. um, now, my question is, do you think that there's something to this trying to find loan words from other languages? And is the concept of loan words helpful to begin with when it comes to studying the historical development of Arabic? Yeah, no, uh, well, I would say yes, it's essential. Um, it's really, really a big deal, which is also why we need to get it right. Um, so so uh, the Quran is full of long words, really, really, really tons of them. Uh, and, and Arthur Jeffrey is, is somewhat outdated by now, but, but I th think still is a pretty good source for these kinds of things. Um, you know, very basic stuff, uh, you know, things related to um, uh, administration and these kinds of things very often are either Latin long words or Greek long words or Latin through Greek, uh, which is obviously just related to contact with the Roman Empire and these kinds of things. Um, but then there's a huge, huge amount of um, religious vocabulary. A religious vocabulary that are clearly long words and you know very central words masjid uh mosque right or malakut kingdom specifically kingdom of heaven these are aramaic long words and are very clearly aramaic long words um 
which tells us something like it tells us something about the audience of the Quran. Um, you know, it doesn't tell us something about whether, you know, uh, the prophet or whoever um, was writing the text or composing the text was somehow stealing from 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 a, a Aramaic tradition. The point is, it tells us something about about the kinds of contact that was around for the audience, because obviously, if the Quran was using a word like like uh, Quran, we'll get into that one in a second. Let's say Malakut for for the kingdom of heaven. Um, and it was using that word. Clearly, the audience would have understood it. Well, why did the, the audience understand this Aramaic word? Apparently, because Aramaic was being used and was specifically being used for religious uh, topics. So it tells us something about what kinds of religion was indeed in contact with the Quranic audience at the time when the Quran, you know, came down or was composed. Um, what were they doing with it? Did it make sense to them? Yes, it must have made sense to them because it was very successful. Um, so these words were around. So we learned something about like the historical context of the religion at the time. Clearly, there was a lot of monotheistic, specifically um, religious vocabulary already in place for the audience to understand what the Quran was talking about. And, you know, that's quite interesting and important. Um, uh, so that's really essential. Uh, the, the, the one point, so let, let's talk about the, the Quran thing. So that's, it's true, like the word, the way it's used, it seems to have the kind of a similar meaning to Qariyana uh, in, in Syriac. But what's interesting about it, is it's not perfect. Like if if the Quran would have wanted to borrow that word, it would have borrowed as Qiryan, which it doesn't. It's called Quran. And so there is a kind of, it's not what we would call a long word directly, but it's a calc. So you take a formation with the specific meaning and you take your own kind of word or make your own formation of that word that's kind of similar to that, but with a native roots and kind of develop it from there. But, you know, anything like kitab is, a, is an Aramaic long word. Actually, qara'a to, to re, read, to recite is an Aramaic long word. Um, uh, salat, you know, uh, uh, prayer is, is an Aramaic long word. Uh, so there's tons of them. Um, what's yeah. kind of interesting about these, these, these Aramaic long words is they don't quite look like Syriac Aramaic, though. Um, so, and this is this is kind of a technical thing. But if we look at, for example, the word for for uh, kingdom um, in Syriac, that would be malchotho. Uh, 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 so it has a khanatha, and it doesn't have the uh, uh, the fatha in between the lam and kha. And in the Quran, it's malakut. And it could have borrowed as Malchuth, but it doesn't. Why doesn't it borrow it as Malchuth? Well, because it's not borrowing it from Syriac. Um, it's probably borrowing it from uh, classical Ethiopic, which also has this word, Malakot. Um, But where did classical Ethiopic come, uh, get it from? Because classical Ethiopic could have still have borrowed it as Malchuth, but it doesn't. Um, so there's this very kind of strange, very archaic looking Aramaic, which is influencing both Quranic Arabic and uh, Ethiopic, and probably also ancient South Arabian, um, which is bringing in all this kind of religious vocabulary. Uh, Rahman, right, the name for, for, well, one of the names for deity, but also an important name for the deity in South Arabia. Once again, Aramaic loanword. Where are all these words coming from? It's clearly coming in with this big baggage of, of like religious vocabulary. And the kind of Aramaic that spread that was somehow a very archaic variety of Aramaic. Not quite Syriac, but something else. So where did that come from? Right. We don't really know at the moment. It's very exciting. Is it possible, rather than uh, Arabic taking from Aramaic, is it also possible that maybe there's like a common ancestor uh, of the two no. languages they both derive it from? No, no, it's, it's a good question. Um, but that's exactly what we do in, in, um, mm -hmm. in uh, historical linguistics. So what we're looking for when we're doing historical linguistics is finding regular sound changes that that where a language changes from one thing to the other and um uh and once that doesn't work uh, that it it's it stops so once that doesn't work it's it's an indication that there might be something else going on and something else going on might be it's an aramaic long word if, so if you see words that have undergone specific aramaic changes or have specific aramaic uh, morphology that's a good indication that it actually comes from aramaic um, so a typical example of this, uh, something um, that I haven't quite grokked until uh, a colleague of mine, Benjamin Suchard, pointed it out, is sometimes you get these pairs 
So um, you have both the verb thaba, which is like to turn in Arabic, and you have taba, which is to, to revert or, or to repent. And those are pairs. Uh, the difference is the one is the inherited word from, from Proto-Arabic and ultimately from Proto-Semitic, and the other one is the borrowed word, because in Aramaic, the tha always becomes a ta. So it has borrowed this word with a t, and it has a very specific religious vocabulary, right? So we have these words. You can totally see how, how um, you know, to repent comes from to return, and that's actually a meaning it still has in the earliest Aramaic, but it has a very specific um, religious connotation. And so it's clearly a religious borrowing. And so we have these two pairs right next to each other, which clearly have separate meanings due to one being borrowed, the other one being inherited. Uh, right. Yeah. So I know there's a lot of emphasis on the relationship between Syriac and Arabic, but I know that uh, there are people who take it very far. And um, there's one particular um, person, scholar, would you call him? Um, you're familiar with the name Christoph Luxemburg, and right. he came up with this book, The Syro Aramaic Reading of the Quran, where he basically argues that the Quran is largely derived from. Um, liturgical Christian Syriac and there's a lot of um, you could say controversy regarding that right. and a lot of my peers would regard his theory as uh, a fringe theory so yeah. I want to hear your thoughts on Luxembourg's um, hypotheses yeah. and I mean so you're... essentially I agree I mean it is a fringe theory and it's a theory which I don't think has any support at all um, so yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's, well, there's not Syriac, but there's Aramaic. I always try to make this distinction. There's Aramaic in the Quran, um, but it's, it's not, not the kind of radical rereading. So first of all, I, I just don't, don't think we can just radically reread anything and start putting dots and stuff, and argue that it's somehow a mixed language between Ar Ar Aramaic and, and Arabic. It's like it's absolutely obvious if you look at the Quran, it's form of Arabic. And it's not, there's not really a discussion here whether, you know, there's some kind of, yes, there's Aramaic influence, but not that kind of influence, not that massively. It's not a rewriting of a uh, Aramaic text into Arabic. Um, whatever it's borrowing from the Aramaic tradition, which I think it is, um, it's not it's not borrowing by literally just kind of changing it or, and it, it even like, I'm not sure if, 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 if Luxembourg quite says it like this, but even the idea that it's like, okay, this is just a misread Syriac word, which kind of seems to suggest that the Arabic script derives from Syriac, which it doesn't. Um, it's a separate, like Arabic script does come from an Aramaic script, but it doesn't come from the Syriac script. So it's really a, a different path uh, from a older, older origin of the script. Um, so kind of, you know, these, these kind of games, it's like, it's, it's really, uh, it's an incredible amount of effort, but it's not very convincing. Uh, that's basically what it comes down to. There's really, it's, it's boring. It's 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 an interesting because it's it's actually there's so much interesting things going on here. Like you know the thing we're talking about this religious vocabulary. There clearly is something going on here. So can we stick to the facts? And that's very important. And even just the idea that you could radically reread the text and not give some kind of explanation for a significant amount of agreement on what the text is supposed to say. Um, that that is going to have to need some kind of explanation. We have you know. 10 different reading traditions, they're really agreeing with each other a lot. Um, and they don't ever have the readings that, that you know, Luxembourg manages to read in them because most of the time it's just bad philology, but still. Um, so yeah, no, there's, there's not much to it, but it's always good to kind of uh, point that out. And it's like, I think it, it, it touches on something that, that we all do feel, you know, there are some of these stories like, uh, you know, Zulkarna and the Alexander legend, which are really striking, uh, the, the Seven Sleepers of Ephesus, which is incredibly striking. So this is connection with, with at least what we associate with, with Syriac Christianity, um, which, um, I mean, the story is always just less radical than the most radical idea that's out there, of course, but there is something there, right? There's something to be researched there. And I think that very quickly makes these kind of radical claims, especially in like popular imagination, um, very exciting. Uh, but yeah, no, it's more subtle than that. But there's something right. interesting going on anyway. Yeah. Yeah, because I think the common tendency of, for a lot of people is to take small connections and then blow them way out right. of proportion. So, and I think um, Luxembourg's theory is an example of that. Right. And um, actually, this is a good um, segue into some of our um, discussions on textual criticism because we did talk about reading traditions. 
mm -hmm. um, already. And, you know, the, when you first um, came on a lot of people's radar, I think it's because of your work in textual criticism. So my I have a general question. So how would mm -hmm. you characterize the current state of chronic textual criticism as a discipline and the direction that it's heading? Um, yeah, so so utterly underdeveloped, but going in very interesting directions. Um, but now slightly longer. Look, um, there's, I mean, really, like like actual textual criticism um, of the Quran has not really been done until recent years. And I'm certainly not not the only pioneer in this, but you know, we're pioneering this right now. And and some good work has been done, you know, 100 years ago by by Nildica especially, and was then forgotten by everyone. Um, but which tends to be a pattern with these kinds of things. Um, but, but really, like, knowing how the history of the text, how it interrelates, um, and actually having access to early manuscripts and, you know, actually studying them hasn't really been done. And for, for, sometimes for, some, for good reasons, we didn't have a good sense of how old these manuscripts are, because none of them are dated, which is incredibly frustrating. Um, except if you radiocarbon date them, but that's of course something that's only been going on for the past years, and especially chronic Arabic, uh, chronic Arabic chronic studies has been slow in the uptake of that technology. Um, so that's something where 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 it's understandable that's not quite developed. And now we have access to you know all these manuscripts have been digitized. You can look at them. You can you know compare hundreds of manuscripts at the same time, and that's really amazing. And um, uh, you know one of the amazing things is just how consistent it is, but it doesn't mean there's nothing to do there. Um, there are changes, and the changes are very small, uh, but the text does change, does develop. And we also just want to know, you know, what was the text really like? What can we say about, about, about this early text? And even if that's a boring story, even that story needs to be told, because if you don't do the, this kind of textual criticism and everybody's like, well, you know, who knows whether this text that we're holding today has any, you know, history at all or whether it was made up by you know some 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 evil conspiracy in the 18th century which is nonsensical of course but you know um you won't know so you have to do it you have to really look at like how do these texts interrelate what kinds of text types do we find uh, can we say anything about it what kinds of reforms do we see in the spelling um and these kinds of things are going on and i think a lot of really amazing work is being done at the moment uh Lots of people are working on it. Uh, people are very interested in reading traditions. People are very interested in, you know, the textual side of things, uh, the the manuscript side of things. Tyson Sitki, um, Eleonor Cellar is doing really amazing stuff, um, and of course uh, Francois de Roche. And you know, uh, all in all, we're really, really come together and doing some really exciting things. Yes, and also um, there's also the fact that there's that Corpus Chronicum project mm -hmm. yes. uh, being done in Germany. Uh, it, that that one particular project, I find that um, they're fairly slow to um, publish new findings. But I guess it's because um, you know I don't know if it's maybe lack of funding or maybe. Um, it's, it's it's also just a lot of work. <laughs> I mean, really. Yeah, that's um, true. That's no, no, true. but it, it, it's really like like don't 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 um, like this is I use it every day, right? CorpusCoranicum.de um, mm -hmm. is the most important website for this kind of work, and um, so part of it is is well, funding is not really the issue. They have a big project. I think mm -hmm. they might be coming to the end of the funding, but they've done a lot of work with it already. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like getting the rights uh, to to publish these things online is kind of a, a chore. Um, so that is always work. Uh, then actually putting them online, getting transcriptions ready, these kinds of things. It's just it's just work. It's just a lot of labor, and it's just thousands and thousands of pages, and it's an enormous coordination you know, with like fifty different libraries, which all have their own fragments, and getting those digitized, getting those up on the website, getting the rights ready. Um, that's a lot of work, and more happens behind the scenes than you expect. Um, so. Sadly, uh, they, they finally started the Twitter account, which is great because now they tell us when they put new manuscripts on. Every now and then, you know, I didn't know there was a new manuscript. All of a sudden, you know, I'm clicking. It's like, wait a minute, this manuscript is digitized? No, I had no idea. You know, you find it and it's like, okay, it's there. And it's actually more often than you'd think. It's just if you're not looking in the right place in the Quran, you don't find it on the website very easily. And you're surprised with what's there because there's so much there. Yeah. Right. And uh, I want to get to your particular contributions to the field, because there's this one article that you put out a couple of years back. Uh, the title is The Grace of God as Evidence for a Written Uthmanic Archetype. Right. And it's a very interesting read. And I like how you look at 
um, variant spellings of Nimat Allah to in the Quran. So could you maybe perhaps give a synopsis of your um, research and findings for the yeah. audience? Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, so this is an article I wrote a couple of years ago. Um, I'm still pretty happy with it, and most people seem to be happy with it, so that's good to know. Um, so what it comes down to is if you look at the Quran, uh, and if you look at you know, even modern print Qurans today, if you look at the Quran, um, there are lots of rather idiosyncratic spellings. Spellings where you think, like, why would you write it like that? Um, there's no obvious reason why you would write it one way or the other. And sometimes there's spellings that are not in agreement with classical Arabic. So what's going on there? And um, what I take, I take as an example, there's many examples, there's thousands of examples like this, but I take one example, which is the phrase Ni'matullah, the grace of God, which is why I called the, the, the article that. Um, and because that's a nice one, because it can be spelled in two ways. So Ni'ma, uh, grace, can be spelled in this, in this kind of construction, either with a, a, a so-called Ta Mabuta or a Ta Maftoha, that is a normal ta or a ha at the end of the words. And it's pronounced exactly the same. There's no difference there. It's just you can spell it in two different ways. And what's nice about it in the print Qurans that we have today, it's basically 50-50. There's 23 cases of it, uh, in both Ni'matullah and Ni'mal Rabbika, so uh, the, the grace of your Lord. Um, so it's spelled in two ways, basically 50-50. There's 23 cases, 12 times is written one way, 11 times is written the other way. Um, so it kind of looks like it was just up to the whims of the scribes of what to do. It's like, okay, where does that whim come from? Apparently it is, you know, perfectly random whether you do one or the other. So where does that whim come from? And what I show is I start looking at, I think, like 30 early chronic manuscripts. It's like, okay, let's look at how these words are spelled in all of these cases where there's this variant spelling. And what you see is that every single manuscript has the same spelling in the same place. So one verse will have one spelling with ha, and then every single manuscript will spell that phrase with the ha in that place. Well, another manuscript, uh, well, another place in the Quran, every single manuscript writes it with a ta. And you, I do that for all 23 of them. Now, how does that happen? How do you get these two different spellings um, being spelled in the same way every single time in every single manuscript? Uh, well, it can be the pronunciation because both of them are just pronounced Allah. Uh, they're pronounced exactly the same. So you can't even say, well, you know, they were, you know, reciting it differently and that's why they were spelling it differently. No, it's very clear they were reciting it exactly the same. So they couldn't have done it off ear. So the only way to explain that they consistently have the same spelling in the same places is that it was meticulously copied from one copy to the other, even taking care of such really tiny spelling differences, which are just not differences, right? They don't have any effect on the meaning and still they copied it to an extreme precision. And the only way that can happen, and if that's the case for all the manuscripts that we look at, is if there was a single source manuscript from which already had these kinds of spell idiosyncratic spellings and they were specifically copied. And so I argue, look, there was clearly a first archetype. All these manuscripts that we have descend from a single source text. And um, that single source text um, if we look at the dating of some of these manuscripts, especially radiocarbon dating, can't have been much later than the 650s, which is a traditional date that the, the Quran was said to be standardized by Uthman, the third caliph. Um, so that really, I think, so I make a pretty strong case for it, where I say, like, look, there were clearly was a standard text, and if you want to say it wasn't Uthman, it was someone else, it's like, well, you don't have a lot of wiggle room, you know, there's not, not you can say, well, it was 30 years later, because even that is kind of, kind of, you know, kind of stretching it. Uh, you could maybe say earlier, but that's not really in line with anything we expect. So really, around that 650, there was a standard text that was set down. But this right. is very different from, from say, uh, you know, the, the Christian Bible, right, the yeah. Greek Bible, where these spellings would not be controlled for at all. Um, but it's much mm. more similar to the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible, uh, which indeed is likewise has this very meticulous copying of uh, spelling differences. Yes, actually, that's really, uh, it's really interesting. You mentioned the contrast with New Testament textual criticism, because I'm thinking of the fact that in the New Testament, we also have spelling variants. For example, um, the word rinome can be spelt with either just an iota or an epsilon iota. And mm. 
in modern in like in most modern printed editions it's only spelled with an iota but in early manuscripts it's sometimes spelled with an epsilon iota so there's been a standardization right but it's interesting how there's not that standardization with the quranic text and uh, so they sort of like froze that um you know those variant spellings in time as it were and that mm -hmm. you could say shows how the um copying process there has been remarkably conservative right right and it's, it even says something about the, the way that's done right so it wasn't someone who had the manuscript in front of them and started reciting it and other people were copying it no they had an exemplar in front of them and had a empty page of parchment next to it and started copying it letter for letter because that's the only way to do it because you can't hear it by hearing it um so yeah uh it, it's really and that that says something about the process we learn something about the text and that's i think very exciting yep so i want to comment on some of these um some of the manuscripts and texts that we do mm -hmm. have um uh, first of all there i remember a few years ago there was a lot of um um a lot of um news over the birmingham manuscript because mm -hmm. that was carbon dated and they found it was actually very early so right. that became touted as one of the earliest um chronic manuscripts and i know you have some um things to say about that could you maybe comment on whether it's as early as it's touted and how significant right. it is for establishing the Uthmanic text yeah um i mean it's so it, it's first of all it's, it's a gorgeous manuscript when you look at it it's really uh, among like the early seventh century ones and i certainly think it's a seventh century manuscript um the early ones is really one of the most beautifully produced uh, amazing things um it's excellent it's indeed has a very early radiocarbon dating i think most people who look at that dating are like that looks a little early but i'm very inclined to to take these things seriously and and rather think about okay um what are we misanalyzing about that date rather than you know start casting doubt on a, a tried and true scientific method um because most people feel like well it's probably a bit on the later end of these manuscripts um so we have a couple of really ancient manuscripts the birmingham fragment being one of them the british library manuscript being one of them the so-called codex parisino petropolitanus being one of them and i would think the the codex parisino petropolitanus which hasn't been radiocarbon dated is probably a little bit earlier just from the paleography um but it's certainly early and it's certainly you know like the second half of the seventh century that's certainly where it's from um, maybe closer to the end of that uh, date that's what i would be inclined to but certainly early and it's important it's not that many folios so actually we, you know we call it the birmingham fragment the birmingham fragment only has four folios um is that right maybe even two actually most folios are in paris uh that's uh about three to eight c where there are like 14 folios but in total it's like it's not that many it's like 18 folios we have much larger manuscripts which are moreover i think earlier um nevertheless it's a very important one and it's clearly a Uthmanic text um the radiocarbon dating is very valuable it gives us a sense like okay you know we're not looking at a manuscript from the 9th century or 10th century which is what very often would happen uh, so one of the one of the things that has happened i think in in recent years and how we now understand the text of the quran is that very often um scholars were very conservative in their dating and would really date all of these manuscripts very late and say well this is probably a 9th century manuscript it's like no there's no way it's a 9th century manuscript but you know there wasn't really a paleography yet we weren't quite sure what was going on with it but it certainly is among the earliest but i think on the later end of those earliest ones uh, but it's a beautiful manuscript it really is all right and um i know that there's also a lot of interest in because the birmingham manuscript it's still also um the Uthmanic text and yeah. all of these manuscripts that we have they're of the Uthmanic text but we know that in the Islamic tradition there were text traditions that are non-Uthmanic um Arthur Jeffrey he wrote another book called materials right. for the history of the text of the Quran where he talks about the companion uh, mushafs of Ibn Mas'ud and Ubay bin Kab and he even gives a listing of some of those right variant readings so how much do we actually know about these companion codices and do they shed much light on the history of the quran's transmission yeah um well yeah i mean it's a huge question and it's very interesting um so it's true um so the islamic tradition especially in the early times but it continues for quite a long time continue to report on 
variant readings or variant spellings even sometimes of what was present in these these uh, mushafs that is codices of the companions of the prophets and those are not always identical to what we have in the standard text today and they seem to be serious um they really seem to have been manuscripts that are like that the differences that are there are still quite minor uh but slightly less minor than what we see in the reading tradition so we see that you know the wording can be a little bit different the construction can be a little bit different and uh, sometimes the text can be a little bit expanded can be a little bit shorter but all in all these 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 look quite genuine um you're like there's no obvious um motivation for these to be made up that's one important thing and uh, not only that it's like very often the kinds of variants they mention is like okay it's interesting for some grammatical detail but very often it doesn't even have that much exegetical value so why are they even reporting this uh, clearly they're not doing it to you know win some kind of theological battle um so they're just reporting it because it was true apparently apparently you could look at these manuscripts and see something about them and learn something about them um and for a long time people were i think still quite skeptical about this and what has really changed that is is the Sana palimpsest, which is one manuscript which was found in Sana, um, which a palimpsest is a, a, a technical term that we use for a text that originally had a text which was washed off and a new text was written over. Parchment is a very cool magical material where you can do that kind of thing. Um, but over time and through oxidation, that kind of stuff, you can kind of see the undertext come back again. And what's really interesting about this text is the upper text, and we have a lot of folios of it now. Um, the upper text is just a standard Uthmanic text, but the lower text is certainly also Quran, but it's a different text type. And it has a different order of surahs, something that is so chapters of the Quran, uh, which is exactly what is reported for Ubayi and uh, Ibn Mas'ud. Um, <clears throat> and it has sometimes slightly different wording. So, you know, slightly longer version of the verse or slightly shorter version of the verse, you know, some words turned around uh, to, and that, that kind of stuff. And it's like, it, it's not like the Sana Palim says is a copy of Ibn Mas'ud's text. There's too many variants of different, uh, different things around, but it's clearly of that kind of same character, yeah. which all of a sudden made us, you know, think about these, these, um, these reports in a very different way. Now, all of a sudden, we had a clear, very early, because uh, that has also been video carbon data, certainly from the 7th century, very early example of a Quran, which is kind of like that. But it's only a single one, and it's been washed off, and the standard text has been written over, which clearly seems to kind of, you know, be in line with this idea. It seems that before Othman standardized his text, a bunch of different companions had their own copies of the Quran, and those copies were not quite identical. Um, still, like, like you know, by, by, by um, Greek standards, it wouldn't even register, you know, New Testament standards, it wouldn't even register as a variant most of the time. But the wording is a little different. There are some things going on. And um, it's really Uthman that kind of got the text in a completely fixed form that from then onwards basically spread outwards. So that's kind right. of what, what these companion codices are about. Yes. So there are variants there and they're more significant than the ones for the Uthmanic text, but they're still not quite at the level of, say, the longer ending of Mark or no, the no, woman caught no, adultery. No, no, exactly not. Nothing. No, no. nothing. So, like so, 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 so something to kind of kind of kind of put this into perspective, even mm -hmm. with the with, with the Sana Palimpsest and the parts that we can read, it can be a bit hard at times. Not a single verse is out of place. Um, there's one place yeah. where, where two are transposed, but they're very similar. Uh, mm -hmm. But most of them are all there. And even verses that have sometimes been identified as um, interpolations are there, which really kind of screws with our, our, you know, the way we imagine how these how these interpolations came about. If they are interpolations, they were there in the common ancestor of the Sana Palimpsest and the Uthmanic text. Well, who is the um, you know the the common ancestor? Well, that might very well be the prophet. Like, there's not that much room to to figure something out. You can, of course, but you have to come up with a very good story. Like, how do you even explain that? Or is it just not an interpolation? That's another option. So we don't we don't even see missing verses. They're not really out of order. Everything is there. It's just they're worded a little bit different differently from what we're used to. Of course, much has not been deciphered yet, but the parts that have been deciphered, if there are any any indications, even back then the Quran was a pretty solid text already, um, which mm -hmm. probably had to do with the written transmission. These campaigns had codices because people were copying down the Quran even very early on already. 
Right. Uh, there is this one um, scholar, Asma Hilali, who recently mm. published a book on the Sana Palimpsest, and she has a very interesting theory regarding it. She says that it's not really a codex um, per se, but more like a series of leaves that were produced in a scribal exercise in the context of a teaching circle. Right. I know that Nikolai Sinai actually criticized this in one of his own articles recently called Beyond the Cairo Edition. But I'm wondering, where do you stand in that discussion? Do you think uh, Hilali's theory has merit to it or not? No, no, I, I, I don't. Um, I, I really, I'm, I'm not convinced by it. And, and I think for me, like it's, it's always been obvious to me, this is clearly an attempt at writing the Quran. And the fact that what is being reported for these companion codices is also in this text. I just, it's just, it boggles the mind that, that you would kind of ignore that. It's like, no, that's actually very important. But what for me really is a nail in the coffin is, is an article uh, published quite recently, and more recently even than, 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 than Sinai's article, is uh, Eleonore Sula's book on, um, uh, not book, article on, what is it called? Materializing the Codex, where she shows very convincingly that these are not just separate leaves of people just kind of you know making a, a, a notes and these kinds of things um she um uh, she shows that actually it was clearly a codex so these things were bound together in by folios into little um choirs as you call them and then bound together and she shows very nicely that Actually, when it was erased, um, the text was kind of unbound and kind of rewritten, but it was basically kept in the same choir. So these these separate leaves were still kind of uh, written together and then bound together again, which clearly shows that it was intended as a codex. It was a full book. We can see the missing bits now. So even folios that we haven't found yet, we can see well clearly that was part of the part of the um, uh, choir here. So we can figure that one out. Um, so that really. Um, brings it together like i think that article says like no no it was not just some separate things it was clearly intended as a quran it's just not the quran as we know it right right i think the reason why some people might be tempted by a theory like that is they don't like the variation and they might look for mm -hmm. a reason to you know push it to the side and say it's not really significant at all yeah, but, but yeah. you know, so 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 you know, if I if I can, can, I think that's true. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's what what what, what I don't think that's what uh, motivated Asma Hilali, uh, but I, I still mm -hmm. I can agree with her theory. Yeah. Maybe um, maybe not yeah, her. Yes. Some of the people who mm -hmm. parroted no. her work. Did. No, no, I, I, I think that's true. Uh, but it's just it's it's just like that variation is there. Nobody had any trouble with this in in, in medieval times. They were talking about this. This was not not some kind of you know secret. And it's still, I mean, I think, I think, you know, if, mm -hmm. if, you, if you come from, a, say, an ap apologetic side, it's like, this is not changing the Quran in any meaningful way. I mean, there's mm -hmm. really, there, there is a, a text here and the message is no different. Um, so, yeah. you know, why get so upset about these little differences? Yeah. So I have a couple more questions and then we'll field audience questions. Sure. Uh, do you think there's a chance we'll ever find more of these non-Quranic Sorry, non Quran, non Uthmanic mm -hmm. Quran text in the future, or you think the chances of finding more stuff like this is slim? I have no idea. Uh, so basically, yeah. so, so I just don't know. Um, so so yeah. I, I can I can say a couple of things about it. So there's a couple of other manuscripts out there, which are not quite as radical as the the, the Sana palimpsest, but have similar things going on. So recently, mm -hmm. a, a article was published um, from um, uh, Mashhad in Iran which is basically the standard text, but it had the original surah order of Ibn Mas'ud's codex. Um, mm. So that's strange. Uh, and it's been reordered and kind of rewritten to, to fit the original order, uh, fit the, the standard arithmetic order now, but it would clearly have, have the Ibn Mas'ud order. And that's not all. It has kind of small orthographic differences, which are different, some variants in there, which are not quite Othmanic. And there's another manuscript which I'm working on, uh, which is also from Sana'a, which is kind of in that same vein. It has kind of weird Sura orders, and a bunch of them from Sura, uh, from, from Sana'a have that. And also have, has a couple of variants which are clearly non Othmanic, which were uh, the text is mostly Othmanic, and then there's some variants in there that kind of break that pattern. So that's a kind of they're not quite, you know, the Sana palimpsest, but they're like these echoes of people like, you know, I'll, I'll stick to the standard text, but when I really want a different variant, I'll take the different variant and they put it in there. Um, so we're likely to find more of those, 
what if we'll find something like the sun of Nipsis, or if we'll ever dig up like you know the actual uh yeah. of, of him Masoud, or a copy of that uh, we will have to wait yeah. and it's just there's no way to know like it might be there we might dig it up uh there's so much stuff still there still not unlocked in iraq yeah. in iran that we just haven't looked at at all yet and we'll, we'll find out right fingers crossed that we'll see it in fingers our lives indeed that'd be amazing <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah so one last question on my end so mm -hmm. If somebody wants to stay up to date on the topic of chronic textual criticism, criticism, who are the authors and scholars that they should be um, watching out for and reading? Yeah. Um, so, well, I, I guess me, um, but uh, certainly mm -hmm. also Ivan Sitke. Um, his work is really amazing, and he's a good colleague of mine and doing great work. Um, uh, Eleonor Celar is really doing amazing work. Um, Bertam Saleh is not really interested in anymore in it anymore, I think, but he did really amazing work on Sana Palimpsest, and I still think his his edition he made together with uh, Mohsen Gudarzi is, is the best edition of the text. Um, so that's there. Um, I'm not sure if Asma is doing much work on it anymore, but you know, she works on these things and is, is busy with it. Um, um, uh, Alba Fedeli um, is an important one. Uh, she's doing some work on, on uh, uh, contact kind of things of, of textual traditions and these kinds of things, but she's, I mean, she's worked on the Birmingham fragment, right? That's, that's her, her baby basically. Uh, so that's really good stuff. Um, and I think, I think we'll start seeing more of it uh, over time. I think more people are starting to understand what the point is and, and kind of getting something out of it. Great. Yeah. So that's about it. That, that's what came to mind right now. I, I'm sure people will come to mind in a second. Like, oh my God, I can't believe it didn't mention that those are important. I do see some questions here in the chat. If you have a few moments to grab a few of these. Sure, sure. Yeah. We should probably start with the ones, the super chats. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Let's yeah. see one. There's one from Neophyte One. Doctor, thank you for your contribution to scholarship. Was the Quran prior to the Uthmanic recension composed of more than one source and author? Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't think so. So, so one of the important findings in, in my book. Um, well, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I don't think so. I, ju I just don't know. But one of the important findings in my book is that Quranic Arabic is at least written in a single dialect, the dialect of Hejaz, uh, Hejazi Arabic, that is the, the region where the Quran is traditionally said to have come from. Um, so Mecca, Medina. Um, and that's, I think, an important, important finding in that sense. So clearly, whatever is going on and whatever is going on, what other sources it is using, um, it has come together at least in a single dialect, which would make sense with a single composer. It's also consistent with multiple composers, but at least multiple composers in a single place. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think there's there's a nice nice article by by um, Sadri on uh, on the single authorship of the Quran, and he does some some great um, uh, stylometry kind of stuff, and it's kind of compelling, uh, but not quite compelling enough. So I don't know. I change my mind on this all the time. And um, whoever I talk to last uh, convinces me of the previous uh, question. This is another super chat. Uh, which Muslim scholars do you rely on the most? Wow. Um, so uh, mostly medieval scholars. Uh, that, that's what I work with. So um, very important in my work is Abu Amr al-Dani, uh, the famous Andalusian uh, scholar. Uh, who worked on everything Quran. He worked on reading traditions, he worked on the Rasam, he worked on vocalization, and basically I'm, I'm using him all the time. Um, Ibn al-Jazari, of course, very important uh, uh, canonizer of, of, of the uh, 10 reading traditions. Um, I really love using Ibn Khalaway, who's done amazing work on variant readings, uh, especially uh, the non-canonical variant readings, but also on grammatical explanations for the different readings. So that's a really cool one. Is the prophecy in Surah Al-Rum historically legit? Um, so I'm going to guess um, that this is about um, the opening of Surah Al-Rum, where um, it either says um, uh, Rome was was victorious or or um, uh, Rome was defeated, and those are two different readings, and they both work. So depending on, on what view you take of what it's talking about, that's one question. And the other question is, um, 
which reading you take, it might be historically legit or not. But obviously, if you have you know two opposite options as readings, um, they can both be right, or at least they can't both be right, but one of them will be right. So I guess the the um, the prediction is there. Um, but you know, it's 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 not it's not an interesting question to me. The interesting question to me is like, why is it even talking about this? Uh, what is it? Uh, what is it about Rome? What is it trying to say about it? Um, so that's basically what it comes down to. And it's like, well, if you have two competing readings which have the opposite meaning, uh, it's really difficult to figure out. And I think people have really you know different intuitions about this. Yeah. So if you have two competing interpretations, is there some kind of objective way to arbitrate between the, the dispute? Um, no, I don't think so. So I think the most important thing, so the standard reading um, seems to be cheering for Rome, that is the, the Byzantine Empire, which considering the, the, the historical situation is not that obvious. Why, why would the Quran be concerned with that? Um, and so, so what's going on with that? Um, and, and then, yeah, you have two, two, two competing options. It's like, well, the only way to, I think, make sense of this and make sense of what's going on is by asking ourselves, what is it even talking about? Can we find something about it? And this is incredibly hard in the Quran because the Quran is um, shockingly ahistorical. Uh, this is one of those few cases where it seems to be talking about something that actually happened. It's like, but what actually happened? Um, and it's really difficult to figure that out. So I, I, you know, smart people have said things about this and they've completely disagreed with one another. So I guess there's a way to arbitrate between it, but nobody has convinced me in either direction yet. So I don't know. How many manuscripts without mistakes are there? None. I um, mean, you, you don't make no mistakes. It's incredibly hard. Um, how many manuscripts are there that have, you know, no mistakes that get corrected? That, so mistakes, but that have actually been corrected, and by that time, you know, are right. It's like, well, what counts as a mistake? So this is this is you know, to a linguist, it's a nonsensical question, honestly. Uh, no offense to to the question asker, but it's like, what counts as a mistake? We're very eager once again to project like modern standard Arabic norms back onto the Quran. It's like, why, why isn't it spelled like modern standard Arabic? Well, because it wasn't written in the 21st century. And um, so, yeah, no, but every now and then we see people make mistakes in the sense that they don't perfectly copy what their exemplar had. And the exemplar might have mistakes as well, but we don't know. Um, what do you call a mistake? What don't you call a mistake? Um, most of it's mostly quite consistently written. And every now and then, yeah, the scribe makes a mistake and very often it gets corrected afterwards. Um, but yeah, copying a, a manuscript without fault is impossible, but mm. they come pretty close. Mm. Who's the best and worst scholar on textual criticism? Mm. I don't think that's a nice question to, to answer. So I won't. No, it's, uh, I, I respect my colleagues and it's great that they're around. Um, if the prophet time traveled and heard people recite the Quran today, would he approve? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I can't tell. Um, I don't think he would have recognized it as something the way he recited it. I think I think the reading traditions have changed over time, especially in linguistic facts as um, linguistic norms developed over time of what was proper Arabic. And they were kind of, there was kind of a negotiation going on about that. And if you're interested in that, read my book. Uh, it's free. And I talk all about it where you can really see this kind of negotiation happening. I think he, he would have probably recited it in Hijazi Arabic none of the Quranic reading traditions today are perfectly Hijazi Arabic. So uh, he would have been surprised by it, I think. But uh, I don't think he would have, he would say, well, this doesn't make any sense or this isn't Quran. He seems to have been quite open to variation in recitation of the Quran. I think uh, look, leave the traditions. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Lewis, I think you had a couple that you wanted to grab. Um, yeah. You know what? Uh, Neophyte won uh, and asked some really good ones. And Anthony asked a good one as well. Um, so one of the ones Neophyte and asked, um, Dr. Van Poon, do you regard the Zechariah Mary narrative of Surah Maryam to be an example of mimesis borrowing from Luke 1, um, 5 to 38? I don't know. I don't have uh, Luke 1, 5 to 38 off the top of my head because I'm not very good with the Bible. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, this, this, is, this is too much, but, but it's also, I mean, like I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a linguist and I'm a, I'm a, and I do some textual criticism, but it's really, you know, like the hardcore lower level textual criticism that still needs to be done, like mm -hmm. figuring out what the language even is and this kind of stuff. I don't know. I don't know. 
Okay, okay. Uh, and then there's one regarding Dr. Crone, Crona mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Mech and Trade, how she outlined how the understanding of Sura 106 has essentially been lost. Does this suggest a vital break in the tradition of the text? Mm. Um, like, I don't know the specific example, uh, but it's an interesting question. Um, I think there's cases uh, in the Quran where, where um, the Quran seems to, you know, understand what it's talking about. And, and we, you know, looking back at it with more, more knowledge of the traditions that were around at the time, understands text better where, where actually each were um, confused by it because they didn't have that context. Um, does that mean a vital break? Maybe um, a vital break in that point. I don't think it necessarily, you know, especially if we're talking about Surah 106, uh, you know, the, we're getting into, you know, cryptic territory. Um, I think a lot of people would have heard of Surahs and wouldn't have made, been able to make sense of it. So even if, you know, there's a break in the tradition, what exactly that those ones meant, I don't think that means there's a total destruction of what the text is even about. Um, so I would say something like that. Uh, Maybe, maybe sometimes there's a vital break in the tradition that we can now understand better. And I think that's good. I think, you know, also just in exegesis and even from a Muslim perspective, you should try to understand the text from the context in which it was. And sometimes we know more about the context now than, you know, uh, scholars, you know, 200 years after the fact knew. Yeah. And then somebody just asked something about uh, Dan Brubaker, and he wants to know if you think Brubaker's work is legit or not. I mean, what is that to say? Uh, so, you know, Brubaker is a colleague and um, he, he, he works on, on corrections in the Quran and he's done, you know, just amazing work uh, collecting all these kinds of things. Uh, he doesn't publish very much, which is a shame, um, but, you know, he has his, he has his little booklets. Um, I think it's pretty good. Uh, I don't agree with everything that's, that's in there. Uh, my colleague Hatem Sitsky wrote a pretty critical review of it, but I thought it was still a very nice review. I don't think um, uh, Dan quite agreed with it, but you know, it's I, I he's just a colleague and we, we work together and yes, right. he's, he's a scholar. Mm. I think the reason for that is I know that Brubaker's work has been used in a lot of mm. polemical contexts right. and that may have tarred his reputation a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and I, you know, I think I think that's partially his own fault. Um, he, 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 he really, you know, he works with these with, with these polemicists, which I think um, are not really good actors. And, um, you know, if he's going to work with them, he's going to have that, that kind of reputation and that's his own, his own fault. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, I, I, I think, I think his work is mostly, you know, interesting and there's lots of stuff to do there and he's collected a lot of data and, uh, and, you know, uh, I think we should just look at what he's working on and what he publishes and he hasn't published something in a while. Uh, but once it's there, you know, you, you look at what that's merits, but you know, he, he's a colleague, he's, he's, he's a thing. And I don't agree with everything he says, but you know, it's, uh, it's work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then, um, I'll, I'll, a couple more, actually three more. Anthony Wagoner asks if, when would the remaining Sana leaves be transcribed and published? Who? Uh, who knows? Um, I don't know. Um, so yeah, um, so this is this is amazing work. So this is in in, in Eleonor Sela's uh, recent article uh, where actually Hatem Sitki, which I just mentioned, helped decipher a huge amount of the folios of the lower text without any good pictures. We were just working off a PDF. Well, we were. He was working on a PDF and kind of was able to kind of look through the lines. And you really need to know the Quran to be able to figure those things out when it's not quite the standard text and that kind of thing. Um, so he recognize a lot of it but i don't think he deciphered and transcribed every single part of it um no i mean to get access to it you obviously need to get access to to yemen uh, which is not easy right now um so we don't know um so these folios they need to be they need to be transcribed they need to be looked at um everything that was there at the time that say um asma hilali uh, published her book was already transcribed even before that by um um uh, sarvi and uh, Gudarzi. Um, so we have quite a lot of it, but still, yeah, there's like 40 folios that haven't been transcribed. Uh, we don't know when that's going to happen, because ideally you want to have high resolution pictures of that, and you probably want to have UV pictures of that, and whether you'll get those, uh, well, not an intent to. Uh, I don't think, I don't think it's easy to get access to that at the moment. Yeah, well, it'll become, it'll be very exciting to see when that becomes available to the public. Yeah, it'd be amazing. Uh, 
Yeah, so a couple more. So Neophyte One asks, um, do you believe the Quran at an early date was heavily dependent on the written text rather than purely oral mm. transmission? Yeah, uh, well, y yes, I think, I think, I think, uh, so uh, there's a really interesting, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say something about this because the article isn't out yet. Um, let's just say um, um, uh, my, my colleague uh, Juan Cole uh, has a very interesting article coming out on this kind of question. Uh, but basically, the written form was clearly important. Um, clearly, if they were so obsessively copying these spelling differences, um, the written text was, in a sense, holy, right? You weren't going to touch that. That was very important. And yes, I think the written text, in coordination with, say, you know, recited text, um, is what the Quran was. The Quran was not just a recited text, it was also a written text. And that's important. Um, people try to, especially these days, try to kind of presented as a purely oral text. And it just wasn't from the start, people were writing it down and have continued to do so and have used that as memory aids to memorize the Quran or to recite the Quran. And yeah, basically that. So no, I think the written form was certainly important uh, in the early period, more important. Well, no, it's just as important today. So today we have a mythology around it, uh, but even today, you know, people still learn from a written Quran. No, it's a printed Quran these days, but still, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, I'll ask one more. I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but it's worth repeating again. Uh, would you agree that a single person authored the Quran at an early state? I don't know. I just don't know. Um, like, like I said, like the last person I talked to convinces me of their opinion. Um, so the Quran looks to me linguistically quite uniform, which is consistent with a single author, but it's not necessarily inconsistent with multiple authors. Um, so if I, you know, speak of what I know, um, I think the Quran was composed in the Mecca Medina area, in the Hijazi dialect, probably in the dialect of Quraysh, which is the dialect of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, that makes perfect sense if he's a single author. Um, but, you know, he could have also had aides who also spoke that dialect and also wrote some parts down. Um, or he could be reusing stuff that was around already. Uh, written in a uh, composed in a dialect, which I think is perfectly possible as well. So I just don't know. Um, I'm inclined to think that much of the composition is from a single person, but even if it's approximately one author, that doesn't mean all of it is completely one author. Right. Okay. It's very, um, very interesting. Thank you for your time. And I think a lot of people really appreciate um, your great work. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Tell us uh, where we can go to find out more about yourself and your published material. Yeah, so um, best way to, to to follow me basically is um, at PhDNix on Twitter. Um, so that's P-H-D-N-I-X. Um, I post a lot of stuff about chronic manuscripts and these kinds of things. Um, you can get my book and maybe we can put it in the show notes or something. Yeah. Like you can you can download it. It's free. It's called Quranic Arabic. It's uh, I'm very proud of it. I'm happy with it. Um, on my academia.edu page, which if you just type my name, my name on Twitter, you'll find it. Um, most of my articles are on there, and you can check them out. And if they're not there, you can send me an email, and I'll send it to you. Uh, but I think anything that will be Quran related is is on there right now. Um, those are the obvious places right now, and. Um, Soon I'll be starting a big, big grant project uh, at Leiden University. Uh, I just got a really, really big 2 million euro grant uh, for the ERC, uh, working on the history of the Quranic reading traditions based on manuscripts. Uh, and I hope uh, in the future, I'll have lots of publications about that topic because I'm very excited to get uh, working on that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. When you do, we should definitely have you on again. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very happy to. It's a, it's a five year project, so maybe in five years, but maybe before that. <laughs> something <interesting. laughs> yeah, I, I'd love to have you on before before then, <laughs> before right. five years. So, yeah, well, you're welcome on the show anytime. So, thanks so, so much for coming yeah. on and doing this. And thanks everybody else. Yeah, and, and I'll put all those links there in the show notes so y'all can Perfect. all look for that. And, all right. Uh, and once again, thanks so much for coming on. And, Lewis, I appreciate you. Thank you thank very you. much. Take care. Take Everybody, care. thank, thank y'all for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure to smash that like button. Also, try to help promote this on your social media by sharing it on Facebook, Twitter, all that good stuff. All right. We'll see you later. God bless.
If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248-431-1440. If you care about the pro-life cause, call them now.